Hey everyone, here's another episode of Mojo Draws with me, the titular Mojo. Uh, today's theme is giving up on shitty ideas and half-baked topics and just doing something you actually want to do. And I guess doing it right as well. Uh, quickly. I assume everyone here knows about Shadow of Colossus and there's no reason not to. I don't see it as a cult classic loss to time. It's probably on every top 10 list for the PS2 that's ever been written. It's been re-released on both the PS3 and the PS4, and that PS4 actually does look really good. The graphical update they did, the remaster, remake, or whatever the hell it is, it looks pretty good. Or at least uh, from the screenshots I saw while looking up reference material for this picture. People people know about the game. I'm going to take that assumption. And its legacy and its impact or whatever. I personally like it quite a lot. And I figured if I had, if I had played it, a few years earlier than when I first did, it definitely would have been one of those uh, developmental, cultural, nostalgic landmarks that people have. You know, those things get placed really high up on pedestals and things. It's it's like the that sort of it's the sort of thing that like shapes your like fundamental core interests for the rest of your life. It's definitely in that tier of games. But I'm not I'm not drawing this out of a burning passion for the game. Well, I, I sort of am, but it's not like I actively think about it all the time. Uh, there's like two major reasons this image exists at all. And the first is that I decided to unbox all my dusty old gaming consoles and line them up in my entertainment system like a good little man child. And in that endeavor, I got around to just powering them on to test them out. And I ended up playing through the first fight of Shadow of the Colossus, just for fun. I, I I can't really play uh, those games much longer than that because the that sixth gener- sixth generation resolutions are just they hurt too much to play. But that that's that's basically it. It was just on my mind. Uh, and the other reason is that I had a completely different idea for this episode of my weird art podcast, and I went and I recorded a bunch of drawing and shit, and I had this whole thing planned with jokes and. I ended up dumping it because the the sort of final drawing that I ended up with was it, it was embarrassingly bad. Maybe not to some people, you know, everyone has their own opinions on things, but to me, it looked like how I drew like three or four years ago, and it made me physically sick to look at it. So all that got tossed into a pit, and here we are now drawing uh, drawing big boys. Uh, this Colossus is Gaius. Uh, I'm unsure if their names are listed in the game or if it's just. That's something you would read in a strategy guide or whatever. The, the internet told me. I believe he might be on some of the promotional artwork as well for the game, so he might be well known. I don't know. I just found a lot of fan art and fan art of him while I was drawing. Uh, he's personally one of my more favorites. I'm not completely in love with him, but you know, he's one of my favorite ones. Uh, I think it's mostly for his design and his battle location. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, it's like a, you got this weird lanky look going on and I had this a toy, an action figure, uh, when I was a kid and it, it was like this lanky zombie thing with giant metal boots and metal grafted over its body and bandages and stuff like that. And I have no clue what it's from. It's lost or whatever, wherever that is. But, uh, Gaius sort of reminds me of that. Well, I'll I'll, ta- I'll just talk about the game, I guess. Uh, like I said before, I don't think this game is like a lost uh, cult classic, but I feel like it. But it feels like a cult classic. It it feels like no one should know about this game. Uh, prior to it, I I wouldn't imagine a game that was just a series of boss battles, with no NPCs, no items, no levels, and. Very, very, very little exposition. Basically, at the beginning of the game, at the end, it's it's a very unique to me. It it feels like an art game at times uh, because there's a there's a very particular feeling the game is actively trying to make you feel. You have a minimum understanding of what's happening. You, this guy, and his little carpet poncho. You've taken your dead girlfriend to the land of the gods because you think that there's something there that can bring her back to life. And when you get there, some god entity tells you that it can help you do that if you slay the 16 colossi around the lands. It's something like that. I don't really remember. That's all the story you get at the beginning of the game. And you don't get no more until the very end. I don't even think there's any dialogue or text. 
or whatever in that period. I think maybe some menus and or maybe the entity tells you something or whatever. You know, that that's the only thing I think is below that is like Tetris or something in terms of story beats. <laughs> it's it's deliberately as bare bones as possible. And aside from you, your your dead ass girlfriend, your horse Argo, uh this is sort of the voice in the sky, the sixteen colossi and some small animals like lizards and birds there's literally nothing in these forbidden lands of the gods you've entered. There's nothing besides an objective. Go kill the Colossi. And you have to ride your horse there and you do a little bit of platforming and things. And then you fight it with your sword, your bow, and your stamina. And that's it. You don't, you don't get anything else. You have to figure out how to navigate the arena, climb and mount the boss, crawl up it while managing your stamina... Avoiding having it shake you off and then stab its weak points until it goes down. It's really more of a puzzle than like a traditional boss fight with like health meters and damage and things like that. You don't like, you don't slash away at the boss. Rolling for iframes and you don't like level up your stats to get better. You just have to figure out how to beat the boss with your standard tools and how to solve it. And you do that 16 times. It's not even particularly difficult. It's just, there's a thing to it like you do this and this and it sort of, Everything slides into place and there's a click. An audible click. And while you're all doing this, you, you really don't have anything that tells you what's really going on. Where you really are or what this voice is telling you these things. All you see is these broken structures, remnants and ruins. and You know that something happened here once. But that's unimportant to you or, or the hero you play as, that main character. He has like one goal to revive his beloved and he doesn't care for the history of this place, which is it's obviously that something happened here. <laughs> he doesn't care that every single Colossus he kills releases all these dark ribbons that fly at you, which is sort of frightening actually. And they flood into him and they cause him to pass out. And he doesn't care that over the course of the game, his skin becomes all pale and sickly and looks like it's filled with dirt and, sores and horns start growing out the side of his heads and this transformation advances every time you kill a colossus and i mean it's obvious to the player you are doing something you're not supposed to do and the open and cinematic invokes this notion that it is it's taboo to come here and you the player understands that but the hero only has one direction he's willing to go and he doesn't care about all this taboo and stuff you the player you have no choice but to guide him on that path and that's sort of a hook. It's a it's it's the genre of the slow motion car crash. So, in this empty world where like the gameplay cycle is quickly established, you follow your sword's light path or whatever to the colossi. You navigate the terrain to it and you defeat it. You can't you can't help but to start thinking about what you're actually doing. You think that beyond the limits of the gameplay. You think beyond the limits of the gameplay as you traverse the landscapes, the deserts, the forests, the ruins and stuff. Like, what are you actually doing? What is this place? What are the colossi? And there's like, there's no hard answers. And I like that. I like it when there are only questions and answers have to come from your own interpretations. That's, that's a mystery, a lack of information. And as humans, we want to find the gaps in these things. We want to find these things out we want to put the pieces together to fill in the gaps to make everything understood so when any medium presents us these things we become we almost become instinctually engaged with it yes we would like to know more and shadow of the colossus does that at sort of a top tier level to me Uh, we can only take in the beauty of these empty landscapes guess at the history of the ruined structures and and the colossi what were their purpose who built them were there more were they alive are they just constructs do they think Uh, These questions, this mystery, is, to me, it's usually handled very poorly in most media, in in my opinion at least. When the whole idea, in my opinion at least, when when the whole idea is based on the lack of information, people who make these sorts of things, they know what people want, which are, they want questions, but then they go ahead and after they give us the questions, they give us the answers. Because they know that there's a dopamine, there's a dopamine hit when you do, but you sort of need to be se- selective with what your answer reserved. The search for answers is what keeps the story and the world interesting. 
there's enough presented to have a story here. It's a, it's a guy wanting to resurrect his GF and that's presented as plain as day. There's, there's no misinterpreting that unless you just close your eyes. And, and there's like an undercurrent of like, Hey, I'm pretty sure what we're doing here is going to resurrect an ancient evil. And that's sort of bad. But I mean, there's an idea of the man sacrificing everything, including other people's like futures and safeties for his own love. And that's sort of like one of those primal narrative things that I think everyone can at least understand. It's basically the ending with The Last of Us. You know, you and you can take from that what you want. But, you know, maybe it's not handled that poorly uh, across like all media. It's it's just that I don't I don't think most narratives, they don't value what is not said. I like things that aren't explained as they engage me more. There's a, a way to explain things in a satisfying matter that reveals a lot, mainly related to the uh, structure of the story and the characters and their motivations and their reactions to things as they happen. But since I, I guess I, since I'm so particular in world building that uh, media like shadow of the Colossus, they just, they just serve as a great structure to a framework to, they just suck people like me in. And that just gets me with endless thinking, trying to fill in all these gaps with theories and conjecture that doesn't have any basis or evidence in the world presented. You know, the, the Colossi seem to have parts of Dormir in them. That Dormir is the entity that tasks you to kill all the Colossi to free them. And it, it's sort of like a we are legion thing. Like whenever it talks, there's a bunch of different voices that start speaking. But throughout the game, as you kill more Colossi, there's sort of like a male voice that dominates the rest of them. And all these Colossi, they have parts of Dormir inside of them. And Dormir was most likely sealed away because he was evil. You know, we see that sort of in the ending cutscene where that priest is screaming like, Oh shit, what did you do? This is, <laughs> this is really fucked up. But like, it's like, why and how did they like imprison a God? Did, did, did a people a race somehow conquer Dormir split, uh, split them into parts and seal them into the Colossi to prevent them from being reunited and awakening. And did the Colossi, did they use the Colossi of tools of war? Some seem to be quite effective at combat and they have weapons, axes and this giant sort of beam rectangle sword thing that Gaius here has. Or was it like multiple peoples, multiple different races since some of the Colossi are humanoids, some are like serpents, some are four-legged and things like that. Did the people lose control of the Colossi at some point? And that's why there's nothing but ruins everywhere. And, you know, who knows? There's there's so many different directions you can go with that. And that that's engagement. So, like, in, in summary, it's, it's the atmosphere of the game. It's like mysteries and questions. Uh, minimalist is a sort of an ironic buzzword for it. A game that makes you pay attention to everything as you kill these giant creature, creatures in an empty land. It's such a specific and sort of simple task that you just wander into thinking about the game in sort of a broader sense. It's, just, it's so different at the time, at least from most games, I guess. It's a, it's a genre of its own now. Like, I've seen other indie titles and games come out that are sort of described as being like Shadow of the Colossus, or just from simply having a focus on fighting huge creatures. Like Prey of the Gods, Titan Souls. Uh, I mean, it's more than just crawling around on big dudes and looking for a flashing point to stab. It's it's a, it's the tone. It's that empty, abandoned world. Something from like Journey, where things have moved on. That's a phrase from the Dark Tower series. There, were, there was something here, but no more. There was history, but no one remembers it. And Hollow Knight is uh, sort of like that in a way. Tonally, exploring that abandoned kingdom, discovering what happened, but like only in a vague sense. You know, you get more answers and more NPCs and a lot more sort of gaminess and shops and things like that. But I mean, that's not really a problem to me. It's just games going in different directions and they know what their strengths are and they know what their weakness is and they know what type of game they're trying to be in the first place. You know, and there's always Dark Souls, because Dark Souls is actually the inspiration for every video game that's ever existed, so you have to bring that up. <laughs> Dark Souls is... The first one 
has that theme of like, what happened here? And you sort of figure it out, but there's still lots of little holes here and there. And NPCs who talk to you are just going to say something cryptic, laugh. And, you know, that's sort of their talking cycle. And you, you can only get certain things out of that. And you can read all the item descriptions. I don't I don't know why every item has a description. Like, there's a little piece of paper you find that has that shit written on it. But you, you have you have to, you yourself have to go out and get these answers. And, you know, if you, it's sort of there if you want it. Which I think is, if you're going to, if you are going to explain a bunch of things in your game, giving the player a choice whether or not they want to read that is pretty good instead of just having a cut scene where things are just explained to you and you can just sit there staring at it while you drool all over your t-shirt. It's just my preference at least. But uh, Shadow of the Colossus is... It's a good game. I think it's... Uh, I think it's as well known as it is for pretty good reason and I don't see any reason to argue with that or why anyone would want to argue with that. You can make the overrated arguments and things like that, but you know, things are popular for a reason. You know, you can't bitch too much that millions of people are going to, you know, going, going to go see the Avengers movies and things like that. They're, they have to have at least some level of quality. You can't call them complete crap and things like that. You can, you can complain about like LCD, the lowest common denominator and things like that. And be like, oh, well, it's just a dumbing down. They've just made something so huge and generic, trying to cast the widest neck possible so they can get millions and millions of dollars and things like that. But it still has to meet a standard level of quality. If it's complete garbage, no one's going to go watch it. Complete garbage just deters people. <laughs> there's always There's always some core of just, like, good in all those massive franchises of whatever media they could be. Uh, I'm not quite sure of Shadow of Colossus's financial reception, but I mean, they've brought it back twice as remakes. So it has to have something there and it is regarded as one of the best PS2 games. So, you know, that's a, that's a win for me. One of a game I really like just from its structure and its tone is also liked for, uh, by millions of other people so i'm like okay there's there's something good there at least <laughs> we're probably never going to see a sequel to this game i don't want there to be a sequel i want there to be spiritual successors because that's where you go out and you make something that's sort of like it but it's filled with different things so it's a new experience and a sequel to this game like wh what would it be <laughs> it's, it'd be the same exact game over again which in all honesty i i wouldn't turn that down but Going out and making something new is always preferable, in my opinion, at least. Um, as for exactly what I've been doing here this entire time I've been talking in this art video, drawing art, um, it's the same as always. You start with a sketch, and you just keep refining the sketch. This is the third primary here, where I'm, I'm going in with a very sort of small, dark brush. Uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of opacity, tweening, or whatever here. Uh, just trying to make as many lines as I can because I like that texture and feel. I like uh, covering large areas with different sort of like line densities and line qualities because it's it's sort of like a pen and ink look where different areas are denoted as being different, not because of the line art, but because they just look different. Like if you look at the sort of furry hair body region, I've put all those little strokes in there to sort of denote that and have it read differently than the armor pieces that are on uh, his body or its body. I don't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't misgender Gaius here. And all the stone pieces, they are mostly white and they have little sort of crack marks or whatever in them, just as a sort of visual note to say, this is made out of stone. It has cracks in it. This is what the stone looks like in this image. That's the sort of language I'm looking. The body has fur, so it has all those little strokes. So this is the language of the furred body. It has all these little strokes. And his sort of shorts there have that sort of cross patch pattern into it. And that's the language of his little shorts or whatever. Uh, the Colossus designs are actually 
I don't know if like they're made out of dirt and stone. I think because whenever you kill one, you can go back to its body, and it's just this sort of lump of dirt and stone that's vaguely in the shape of the Colossus. Uh, I don't know why they have all these furred body parts. I think it gameplay wise, those are the things you have to scale up. You have to climb up on its fur and stuff like that. And there'll be like little ledge pieces here and there that you can scramble up and things like that. Like his little belt, I guess (laughs) you could say that that's actually sort of a flat platform that you can actually stand on. And then you can jump to his arm right there. That big circular piece which breaks off, I think, somewhere in the combat. You can climb up there, and you're supposed to get the top of his head and stab him a bunch. That's how you sort of kill all the Colossuses. But their their design is probably another reason why I like the game so much, because it's just... It's not really something I've seen before, and it's interesting. All the the Colossus have this... They're all, like, silhouette and shape-wise completely different, or at least they fit in the classes of, like, humanoid, quadruped, serpent... And, uh, well, it's just those three classes and just different sizes and things like that. But they just, they look weird. Like they have those furred bodies. They have all this stonework on them. Like, what does that mean? It's just, it's, it's another thing of like, why, why do they look like this? What was the aesthetic that these people were thinking of when they built these things? Did they just put those shards of Dormir's being in these things and they just looked like that because of it? You know, why do they have the powers they do? Why do they have the weapons they do? It's just all very, very interesting to think about these ideas. And you just talk about it and use it to fill dead air. It's just interesting. And I like interesting things. My uh, my idea, art-wise, was that I, I really like pen and ink looking stuff. I like just making, I just like making line work. Tons and tons of line work. I don't actually like color, but here's the color anyway. And I've always had a slight problem with how exactly do I combine color with all this line work. Because if you try to go through a, like a full value range with color, I mean like really dark darks, really light lights, mainly really dark darks, the dark darks, the really shadowed areas, sort of kill your line work in those areas so it's like why did you even make it there at the beginning if you're just going to kill it so that's sort of a forward thinking thing i never have because i'm just sitting here making as many strokes as i can because i like the feeling of doing that and i like the look of it and i'm guessing the the shadowed areas need to come from that line work and any color would just have to behave sort of as like a wash or something like that like a watercolor or thing that you put on it just very low contrast very sort of like watercolory where it's spread around and not really distinct in any real area here i just i tried to smush all my sort of colors and hues and stuff into sort of green browns and uh just greens and browns and yellows and i i think i put a little bit of blue into that sky there i use a lot more blue later or it may just be just like a slightly darker more grayed yellow which looks sort of blue when you put those two together that's another thing is when you smash colors together, my brain just, I don't understand that. I'm not a color guy. <laughs> I'm a line work guy. That's what I like to do. And so that's sort of what I feel. I can feel the line work more than I can feel the color. And that's always been annoying to me. But around here, I decided that I was going to go pretty low contrast with any colors and just sort of put different colors in there and sort of smear them around. So like you can tell that something's there, but it's so far removed from the sort of starkness of the lines that your brain can easily interpret that. It's like, oh, I, there's a line there and it's pretty obvious, but I know there's gradation around it that sort of speaks t- speaks more. And here I'm going in and just uh, sort of semi-shading everything, fixing that bush. And putting in there, like the the whites of those little stone structures there, I think, are really they look pretty nice. They're little they're little like secondary ports points of interest they can look at. And they're sort of for scale as well. The colossuses, uh, I don't know how well I can trust this, but their sizes seem to range from like here, Gaius here is like a hundred eighty feet tall or something like that, 
and sort of there's like other Colossus is around his size of the humanoid ones. And then there's some quadruped ones that I think the biggest one's bigger than him, but the smallest one is smaller than him, obviously. And then there's like a second set of quadruped ones that are just really, really small. Like they're almost like actual animals, like actual, actual sized animals, which is interesting. And then there's serpent ones that are like bigger than all the rest of them because they sort of just fly or glide around, which, you know, they can make them bigger at that point because it sort of makes sense in a biological way. The, his body colors were sort of, if you look at their color sets, they're always, they're these like browns and uh, mostly browns actually, like in green sort of, it's very murky and it's really hard to see on the PS2 graphics anyway. I didn't really check out any of the, uh, the way they looked on the PS4, which I should have maybe, but it was, it was difficult trying to separate those out and it still makes sense and in a way it's sort of all blends together with maybe like the faintest sort of hints that the armor color and the furred body color are different but i think what's really making those things look different is the fact that it has those different textures on the on the line work and that's, that's carrying more weight. And it sort of lets you also think, well, those things, maybe those colors are a little bit different, I think. Maybe that does make sense for me to look at. And the end result sort of looks like that, but I don't know. Like, I like how it turns out. I'm just, I'm unsure if I managed to do that successfully. And right now I'm just, I decided just to put in shadows and stuff like that. The shadows get a little bit too dark, but I think it looks okay. It probably looks fine in a way. And a couple, a couple areas where like the line work starts to just disappear because the shadows get too dark. Again, I just want to do a wash. I'm not really focusing on any colors I'm doing here. I'm just, I'm basically just going back and just using sort of a dark blue at sort of a mid opacity brush to wipe over and it sort of blends and once it's blended there i just pick color pick the actual color that i've sort of made there and just use that and if it doesn't look right i control z a couple times and try again until i get sort of something that just looks right to me i can't i can't just think of where i need to move the color i need to actually put the color down and look at it and be like well does, does that look right i guess uh, when you're doing like rendering paintings and sort of things, you would, you have to like put a bunch of colors down and that's where the color theory would come in where you like, you basically plan the color at that point and you sort of know what you're going to do. And then sort of more subtle shifts, you just do that naturally by continuing to draw and selecting the colors that you make and just controlling your values at that point and the values is basically how dark or light it would be. And I've gone in here and just uh, put like, I think one overlay layer. I tried to stay away from actual like layer modes and just use mostly normals, but I put like an overlay layer and put some sort of like glowing orange in there. And look, there's the final piece. I added some little birds and shit because I forgot to draw those until the very end. Now, by the way, I like the birds. They're sort of like a for scale thing and things like that. It looks interesting. But I mean, it's a, uh, it's interesting to sort of look at a, at a, at a design like this that is in, in reality, it's really complex. All the little stone pieces and things that, that is on him, but you can just sort of, he could draw the major bits and things like that, but you can go in and sort of just fudge the other stuff because like, you're going to be able to tell like he has the the sword and the giant ring thing around his elbow there. But does it really matter like what the pattern is up there or sort of like the molding of it? Not really. No one's going to pay that much attention as long as it's close enough, I guess. But anyway, that's the art. Gaius from Shadow of the Colossus. I had fun with this. I think it turned out pretty okay, which is all I can ask for as an artist. 
Uh, really complex, but also not really if you know where not to give a shit. If you want to see more of my art, you can check out the links in the description, or maybe they're on the screen or in a pinned comment. I don't know. They're somewhere. But while you're looking for that, if you happen to see a little Patreon link, you know, give it a little click, maybe pledge a few bucks if you like what I do. I've got a little teaser up on my I'm up on my Patreon for the next Sony Plays animation, which hopefully will be out by the end of the month or at least the first few weeks of April 2021. Thanks for watching. I'll be back later with some other rambling thing. See ya.